Hello, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our final one-on-one -on -one of this year's 2023 NGC Bocas Lit Fest. I can't think of a finer way to have a final one-on-one -on -one conversation and with our very own winner of this year's OCM Bocas Prize for Poetry, Anthony Joseph. As many of you will know, Anthony has had a virtuosic career spanning poetry, but also including music, fiction of both short and long formats. He is a master of imagination and wordplay. Joining him in conversation is the prolifically and prodigiously talented scholar, Amilcar Sanatan. Please welcome them. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I would never challenge Shivani's integrity, but her dishonesty in my bio is a point of concern. So I just would like to acknowledge my failure of those expectations, but I think everything she said about Anthony was true. So um, I have to be a little bit scripted in this life, so it just gives a little structure here. And I was profusely late by two minutes running down here, but I think I got in my steps for the day, right? So today we have the pleasure to listen to the readings and insights of Anthony Joseph. His recently published collection of poems, Sonnets for Albert, won the T.S. Eliot Prize for Poetry in 2022. He joins, oh yeah, big him up, man, big him up. If anyone wants to know how much money he got from that prize, I could tell you afterwards. Or oh, you could Google it now. Yo, I need to write poems, man. If that is the pay. <laughs> I think that's the only poet that gets paid when they win that prize. But he joins a distinguished list of select Caribbean writers who have explored conventions in poetry and truly weighed in on conversations of our time. Cigarette packs, rum, suits, bareback men, Tobago, flights, carnival, wild meat, food, rituals of manhood, displacement, and yearning. These images and themes are prevalent throughout the text. It illustrates Afro-Caribbean life in simple, everyday ways in Mount Lambert, Sawa, and Port of Spain. The geography of the poetry is extremely familiar through Anthony Joseph's, and he has made, though he has made his literary fame in lands beyond Trinidad and Tobago. His recent publication, similar to the fictional biography of Lord Kitchener, is part of a wave of contemporary Caribbean works by male writers, Raymond Antrobus, Roger Robinson, Kai Miller, Colin Robinson, and others, who critically explore masculinities in the region. These interventions are necessary as societies grapple with crime and violence, the pervasiveness of violence against women, and the focus on socioeconomic empowerment of families and regional and national development. So no stranger to his native land, Bocas Litfest, as a reader, workshop facilitator, and multiple award winner, everybody make some noise for Anthony Joseph. <laughs> no, no. No, 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 I have a question for you. Sit down, sit down. We're in class. This is the only time I have power over him. <laughs> Everything else is an autograph in a line. <laughs> so, before we invite him to read, I have to have one question, you know. You know, he's just up a little fabulous. I have an inferiority complex on the stage. And that's no problem. So, you're going to read two selections of poetry today for us. Okay. But I always look at uh, the first line in any text. You know, I think I got it from Albert Camus mm -hmm. in L'Etranger, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, how you start your book or what you read. Yeah. So you open the collection with breath. And you yeah. say, when I hear my father dead, I flew 10 hours into the sun. Next morning, I put black on, waistcoat, white shirt, soft pants, the new brown half brogues. So these opening lines, it shows us masculine performance, ritual, yeah. the clothes, son as the flight you have to yeah. take, son as father relationship to the son, mm -hmm. son as the tropics and the Caribbean as well. Mm -hmm. Tell us why you would open a collection on your father with the death of that man and then work his life a little bit back to front. Well, the, um, the ordering of the text and the book, first of all, came as they came. There was no... There was no plan, there was no like, you know, arrangement, I'm gonna start here. It's just, that's how the poems came. So the first poem that came to me, came to me after I'd returned to England. So it was a, a strange thing about writing, about going to Trinidad, f 
for my father's funeral when I had just come back from Trinidad and I was in England. But something about that journey was really interesting and really important. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, going into the sun, you, you're right. It's going in, you're going into the tropics. You're going into the Caribbean. Uh, so there's that. But there's something about Icarus in there as well, about the flight, the, 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 the fire and the flight into the fire. I don't know, you know. Um, but also I have to say that uh, that line, the rhythm of that first line, is something that I, I, I don't think I stole, but I borrowed. And if Linton is here, he would know what I'm talking He's not, thankfully. But um, Linton Kwesi Johnson has a poem called Reggae Fi Dada, which starts in a very similar way. It says, and when I hear my daddy dead, you know. And that kind of haunted me. So when I came to write, that came to me as well, because that's what I was trying to say. It's that moment that you hear, you know. So it's a good thief then. It's a good thief, yeah, yeah. it's a good thief. Um, yeah, I mean, I think William Burroughs used to say, you know, um, there's not, you know, if it's a good poem, it's worth stealing, you know. Um, so yeah, something like that. So yeah, that's, that's for sure, Anthony. That's thanks about. for opening up what the collection is, and please read for us. Right? So can I just sit here and read, or do you want me to go up? There? It's up to you guys. Sit there. Yeah, once the camera people say so, yeah, God, yeah. I get cussed out after. All right. So um, yeah, this book deals with a lot of. Um, I won't say dark things, but real things about my father's illness and demise. One of the things that I noticed about him when I saw him for the last time was that he was ashamed. There was a degree of shame that he was ill and, and dying on his way out. And this is a, a poem that I try to capture that in. Shame too. I was recording in St. Anne's and had one day free. So I told my father I'd be back in December. And he said, December? No, I want to see my son, Tony. We're in August. Everything is symbolic in literature. The dust at dry noon in Sambuco. The small birds within the emptiness of the cricket field. Heat burning water into sound. Tall jungle. My father appeared through curtains. Thin with eyes that now saw past the limits of ours. The impish swirl of his laughter was gone. In the photographs I took that afternoon, he seemed to be leaning away, leaning as if from life, from love, in shame. And um, thank you. And uh, for anyone that's gotten the book, you will see that there's a, f there's a photograph of that very, that very moment where he's, there's a lean, and that's some of the last photos that I took of my dad in Sambuco. Um, so, light. Light. Fill the air around these houses. May my grandmother continue to water her roses and touch the aloe fronds in her forever time. Light. As you lit the morning, my father arrived unexpectedly in his new Hillman Hunter, and Mammy ran into the yard to embrace him. And until my grandfather put wire around the veranda, I could sit and swing my legs off the banister, or from the garden spy up the thighs of my father's new girlfriend as she laughed with ankles crossed, as Albert molded his mother's anteriums. My grandmother fried fish. We ate. She was happy. Even as she knew that later that afternoon, my father would be gone again into that gone momentum. Um, this is a, the next poem I'm going to read is the, is the only memory I have of my mother and father together. My mom and dad uh, got together when they were really young. My mom had me when uh, she was 18. My dad was probably in his early 20s. Oh, here's Linton now, so I, I, got, I got away. I got away with that thing. I'll tell him out. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, they, got, they, got, they, they had a rough relationship. They were, pretty, they were probably too young, so they broke up. But they kept getting back together again, and they got back together a year after that and had my, my brother and stuff. But that's another story. Um, but the only memory I have of them is a, it's just a glimpse of a memory, is of, a, of violence, essentially. And I try to capture it. 
uh, in this poem. But this poem is also about the fallibility of memory, the fact that sometimes you remember something happening in a certain place. And when, thanks to Google, you can Google it and find out that it didn't actually happen on that street. It happened on another street. And this is one of those examples. Exactly, yeah, this is, this is it. Yeah. So this is a poem called Jogi Road. From life, from love, in shame. The red sawmill on Jogi Road with cedar grain in its fibrous air. Red. The old train track and the bridge where my mother's rage was bruising the dark. Her fingernails ripped at my father's shirt, his face. This is blood. The way he looks away, then down with open palms in resignation. But memory has a curious sting. The red sawmill was not on Jogi Road, but on Silver Mill. And in the savannah, there were five salmon trees which cried when cut, not six. My father held me over his shoulder that night. No, I was looking up from the road. Yeah, so one of the great things about reading in Trinidad is I don't have, I said this I think last night, I, I don't have to explain anything or, or translate anything. So there's a couple of poems in here that are in, 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 in Creole, in Trini Creole, and this is one of them. I'm going to read a couple of them. This is one of them. This is in my father's voice. This is the way that my dad would speak. It's based on a story that he told me, uh, my stepmother and my stepsister. Um, you guys will recognize what it's about because this is Trini, man, you know. Fire for you. I say, Kairoon, keep away from me. Keep away from me, Kairoon. I'm going to let go it. She bawl. Oh, God, Uncle Joe, I call in the superintendent. I say, Kairoon, you could call who you want. I have him. I tie up Megwana and I leave him in the office. He can't move with the tie I tie hand behind his back. When I'm ready to go home in the evening, I put him in a crocus bag and I come up the road. I bring him home alive. But time I reach home, I'm tired. I say, you see me? Me I go in and bun no guana now, na? I leave him in the bathroom. The next day when I come back from work, he raise his head so. I say, well, brother, well, fire for you, we. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's, fun, it's fun writing sonnets like that, which kind of completely go against the sort of expectation of the tradition. You know, you really are uh, subverting and being very subversive with the form. Um, so maybe I'll just read a couple more. One, one more. All right. So... Duh, 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 duh. This is one of the poems, I guess, where... Um, I mean, my dad was a... Uh, a, a terrible father, but I loved him, which is a, a, a strange thing. He was terrible in the sense that my dad had probably 10 or 12 children, no one's really sure, and he was not a father to none of them. Very itinerant father moving from woman to woman, having lots of children, which is a, sadly a common experience for a lot of Caribbean people. Um, but this book gave me the opportunity to kind of uh, challenge that and question it, even though he wasn't there to respond to my challenges. This is one of the poems in which I try to address him directly and ask him what, what was that about? Broadway. You don't have no shame fathering all these children. You scatter offspring all over the island like seed that get fling and still sprout in your walk away. Please. How you could grin and claim is the woman say she want a child from you. As if it's trap, she trap you. I have an image of you waiting for a taxi in Karep, 1973, in your gun mouth pants and suede boots, knocking the cigarette pack, knocking the cigarette heel to the pack, black and handsome at sunset. And was you self when your life force was leaving, who cry and say how you know you wasn't a good father? But it's a long time now we forgive you, Albert. Not for what you was not, but for who you promised to be 
and unfulfilled. For the way your laughter could spark up space like matchstick flame. So, Anthony, I, that actually leads to one of the questions I have here. You look at the infallibility of memory. But I want to think about the infallibility of masculinity. There's a way that I think you have written an acceptance of your father. But I'm not sure if it is as clear in that acceptance of the man. You have accepted that model of manhood for that time. Mm -hmm. What does that inheritance mean for you? And do you think it has any utility today? Now I'm asking questions I believe we could all answer. Yeah. But I, I wanted to know if in your work you, you were probing that in a way I couldn't read throughout the book about that legacy, accepting a man, mm -hmm. but not accepting that approach to manhood. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's definitely true, yes. On one level, I do love my father and accept that that's how he was and he was flawed, you know. But that doesn't mean that what he did and how he lived his life was necessarily a right way. I think he's still, you know, I think there's too, I think, I mean, let's just be frank. I think in this, in the society that we live in, well, the, you know, in Trinidad and in the Caribbean in general, men get away with a lot of stuff they shouldn't get away with. And especially my father's generation, there was a sense that you could be promiscuous or you could have lots of women and that that was, that was cool. Um, and I don't think there's an excuse. For, I don't think we can excuse that by just saying, oh, that's how Trini man is and, you know, laugh it away. I don't think we can because my father knew that he was doing something wrong. He, knew, he was aware. He said to me that, you know, I know I wasn't a good dad. I knew I, I knew it. You know, I, I, things was, that was just my life, you know. So on one level, you know, you can't keep blaming your parents or, or coming down on your parents for the way they live their life. They, has, they, they had their own struggles. My dad had his own struggles. Uh, so I don't excuse that behavior. I still think people should be held accountable for that, you know. But um, as a human being, on, on a one-to-one -one level with my dad, he was, he was a human being. And I, you know, I saw things in him that I loved, and he loved me. And there was, you know, there was something there that was worthy of love, which is why I wrote about him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think you can go into the past and change the past. I think you either have to come to terms with it or move away from it, live your life differently. And one of the things that, are, that are, uh, for me is important is that I am nodding like my father, you know. I mean, you know. I'm nodding, 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 nodding. Somebody like disagreeing in the audience now. <laughs> they read the book, but they knew you more. <laughs> and they vehemently no, no. disagree. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm not like my dad. No. He turned I'm red, like redder, you know. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 Barbara. No. Barbara. No, 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 no. We like to adjourn this session. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I want to take that. Let's go one step further. Yeah. After completing this meditation on Albert, what is the meditation on Anthony now? Mm. Well. That song smart than it actually is. <laughs> but I saw I mean, poetry works. Is that is that even a the question? The middle of the week, Wednesday. Is that even a question? Wednesday, <laughs> almost the middle. <laughs> I don't know if that's even a question. I mean, you know. Yeah, I just sound good, so I do that for Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> so guy. No, but no, I mean I haven't done this work. That yeah. has transformed you in some way. It's you're reconciling memories, you're thinking about your own position, your experiences with partners your relationships to other young men. Yeah. I met you actually, as I said, in Queens Hall, you're talking about jazz and so on. Okay. The Caribbean Male Action Network and you came there oh, as yeah, a yeah, yeah, speaker. Yeah, I know right, you forget right. me, but you yeah, didn't forget right, the right, forum. It's not seen. And uh, <laughs> when you had the conversation, <laughs> you're talking about the overwhelming presence of your father, even though he was absent. Yes. So I just wanted to know how you manage these memories moving ahead mm -hmm. and the types of conversations you have with young men and young women throughout the region after done in this kind of work. Mm. Um... I mean, you know, the, what is the meditation in me and all of that? I mean, I think um, there's a lot in there about um, mortality in a, wider, in a wider sense. So there's a lot in there about me looking at my life, getting older, and, you know, uh, getting to an age that I remember my father being. And, you know, you sort of getting, life is a circle, you kind of realize that. So that's one thing that I, I don't know if I learned that from it, but it really did, it's a mature work. It's, it's the sort of most mature work in the sense of looking at life for what it is uh, and, you know, confronting my father's 
death and his, his life kind of put a lot of things in perspective to me about just the philosophy of life, how you live your life, you know. Um, but in terms of conversations, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I think the personal, you know, is the universal. The more personal you get in your work and the more honest and the more open and graphic and, and brave that you are in revealing your inner world and your memories and the, the truth, the truth of what happened to you, you touch the most people. And I think that that's, what the, that's why the book has been successful, because it's speaking to a lot of people who've had similar experiences. Yes. Without me having to go out there and speak to them directly, the book is doing that work, you know? Similarly, the subject is both Albert, the father, but also the sonnet as a form. Yeah. So after having done this process and really working through using the nation language, um, the way that you use different types of line formations as well, tell me what revelations have come to you about using the sonnet as a form to reflect on Caribbean life? Yeah, I think the sonnet is, 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 a, is a really interesting form. It's, it's, a very, um, it's deceptive in the sense that it appears to be this imperial form, which it is. It's an, it's an English, it's, well, there's, the roots of the sonnet are not in England at all. The roots of the sonnet are in Italy, are in Renaissance Italy. And it started, the roots of the sonnet are in song. Sonnet comes from Italian sonetto, which means little song. So it started as music. It started as a song. Uh, and it, it, it developed this particular way of arguing. You know, the English sonnet is a particular form of the sonnet in which there's an argument that's put forward and in which the poet almost speaks to the reader and argues about what they're feeling and argues to, and comes to a conclusion. So that's a unique thing um, to English, the English sonnet, but it's not a unique thing to human life. This is how we interact with each other a lot of times. We say, hey, you know, this is what I feel. What do you think? Nah, I don't agree with you. You know what? This is what it is. So we have this argument. Discourse is like that, you know. So the sonnet fits um, any sort of argument or, or interrogation that needs to be done about something emotional and personal. You can use this, the form to interrogate it and question yourself and, 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 and work through what you think and come to some sort of understanding of it. So I loved the idea of having my father as a subject which I could interrogate, interrogate the little glimpses of memory I had of him and come to some sort of understanding in the last section of the poem of what it was, you know, because he was a mystery. It was a mystery to me. So the form was really about a, a sort of a detective work in, you know, in verse, trying to understand and decipher his mythology. Yes. I you think know. something that was equally profound in, to the form is the organization of the book. Mm. You use photographs as archives throughout it. And uh, it's kind of interesting, like in the Caribbean, we often profess our love for the oral and the visual to complement what we do with the scribal. But um, few texts um, carry the pictures, perhaps for business reasons and the limitations mm. of the publishing press. Yeah. But your work is a family archive as well. I feel that yeah. you made a deliberate effort to let us know the face of Albert, to see you with dreadlocks once upon a time and many other different items. <laughs> it's, not, it's not late enough to have shade. Yeah. That was a long time ago. Um, yeah, the photographs were there because I wanted the book to feel um, like people were reading a film, like you were watching a kind of a documentary, like you were reading these poems and then after reading a poem, you would see the picture. Some of, some of the poems relate directly to the photographs. Like there's a couple of, there's a picture in there, me and my brother and my father under a tree in Malik, you know, and there's a poem about that, which is you read the poem and you see the picture and it, I think it creates a different sort of dynamic for the reader. There's a different sort of more bodily, physical experience of seeing as well as hearing and reading a poem. So I wanted it to do that work. I wanted it to be very um, sort of dynamic, yes. you know. I want to... Pull the next question. I feel like I got police here. I just have a set of questions. Um, yeah. yeah, it's about the gone momentum. You refer to in the poem Light. Uh, if I'm correct, yes, Light on page 8. That gone momentum and thinking about your father's absence. But we have a, a larger conversation in society about a male role model deficit, uh, the absence of the father as the source of social problems and malaise, yeah. which unfairly burdens what women go through and mothers who are present and the contributions they make. 
um, how would you weigh into this conversation by really talking about the sense of loss that a young man could feel without that presence of a male figure at the same time not displacing those who are actually present in it mm. and who may arguably appear much less in your work here mm -hmm. because you mentioned your mother but her photo i think i see one photograph of her in the wedding portrait yeah. and so how how do you manage that to not reproduce a silence around women who are present mm. while speaking through that sense of loss? Wow. Um. <laughs> it's a political environment. It's, 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 in, it's so. good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Thanks. I've got to think about that. That's, um, well, I mean, let's start at the, the, the tail end of that question. My mom, yeah, my mom appears once in this book, but in terms of a photograph of her, but she, she's all through it. You know, there's various poems in which she, she, in, she, she infiltrates it. But um, I've written about both of them for many years. I've written about a lot of poems about my mom. I mean, my mom died at 47, and I, I never lived with her. Uh, so that is a whole other thing, which I don't think I'm ready emotionally to sort of write about yet. Um, but in terms of um, the other political stuff, I think it's hard for um, any poet to sort of take on that that responsibility, you know, the responsibility of being a, a spokesperson for a malaise in the society, you know. I don't know if I can speak to that. I can speak to that through the work and let people sort of have the experience of reading the book and come to their own ideas. I don't think I can take a responsibility and say, this is how we should think about these things, you know. Um, I did a, a BBC radio documentary about, well, based on the poems in this book, and we were very careful the producer and I, to avoid slipping into that absent father trope, you know, trope. Because it's, it's come to sort of represent Caribbean masculinity in kind of a negative way. And it, it's, even though it's, you know, yeah, we have to deal with the fact that it exists. But it's come to be sort of shorthand for describing a particular kind of masculinity, which sometimes it's necessary to not, not have to confront head on, but to sort of go at it sideways. And I think that's what I do, you know. All right. Well, one more question with Stephen Sacco from BBC and Hard Talk. I just wanted to think about... That's my favorite show in BBC, sorry. Yeah. And that's the only place I heard a steel pan every day. Yeah. Right. Not in Trinidad and Tobago, only BBC intro. But yeah, I wanted to think about disability, which I felt like a consistent theme. It, it was the figure of a mature man and the developmental stages and the body is in decline. And you are reckoning with that so much of masculinity is made around what a man has as physical progress. But when we begin to lose that power, the sense of shame, but shame is just a short word for a longer feeling of, of the lack of uh, sexual power, economic power, uh, the younger man growing up as an adult man and negotiating with you. I find that quite interesting that the way you almost see the feelings, the sense of feelings your father had and he professes over time. Yes, yes, and you yes. try to absolve him in a certain way. Yeah. But can you talk about disability, especially as it relates to the body and men? Mm. Yeah, that, that is really interesting. I mean, my dad, um, my dad wasn't a particularly big or, or sort of a, a, a macho kind of guy. He wasn't like that. But he was very, he had a lot of energy, a lot of sort of... Um, I guess spiritual energy. He had a lot of energy around him. He was always the life of the party. Um, and seeing him as he declined, yeah, that was kind of hard. There, was, there, was, there were points where, as I said, there was shame. There was a degree of shame. There was a degree of denial. There was a degree of like, I will get better. It'll be okay. I think my, my, my brother was the last person to see him alive. And even on, on his, like, he was, as he was dying, he was still saying, boy, I need to come out of this hospital, you know. He was still, yeah, so there was a real denial. I admire that. I think that's, that's you know, I mean, it reminds me of, um, you know, do not go gentle, you know, that sort, of, that sort of thing, rage against the night. So he was definitely that kind of figure that didn't, never said to me anything about, oh, I'm getting this, I'm getting weak, I'm getting, you know. He was just sort of positive, even though he was, his body was failing him. He was kind of positive and thinking that he would overcome it. So I think there's something to be said about that, that is, that, is, that is good, that is praiseworthy. It is a good way of looking at your life. I, I hope I'm like that when it's my time, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I mean, as I said, he wasn't no, no, no big, strong guy. Um, and I got to see him at various stages of his life. I got to see him when he was you know, relatively young and handsome and doing all his things. And I got to see him later in his life. 
And yeah, um, he was the same person, you know. He was the same person. So there might be a physical disability, but the mind was still the same. It was still the same person, you know. Certainly. So, Anthony, I know people didn't come to listen to me as a good student of your work, but they came to listen to a great poet. Mm -hmm. So could you share with us about five more poems as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, what do I know of my father's body? Not even a bottle of duty-free rum or a carton of the Morier. This time I come with both hands swinging. Arriving first at the funeral home where you are already waiting in your pillow box, exuding a kind of warmth. You are my father's body, but I know so little of you. I know the soft weight of your hands on my shoulder at the airport. I know your rings. And I felt the muscle of your panic wrist once when we were far out at Maracas and the ocean almost overcame us. I have seen your gut grow into its own sonnet and your head grow gleaming and bald. But today, it is your chest I come to know. How rigid it is when I press upon the crisp sheen of your burial shirt to tread a rose through the eye of your lapel. And I find the pall-bearing weight of your life when we grip the casket's chrome to lift and carry you down to the hearse waiting in the bright yard. Rings. So this poem, I read this last night at the prize giving ceremony. Um, this is a poem about how I, uh, I got this ring. This was my father's ring. Um, and yeah, the poem talks about how I got it. So my dad, when I was a kid, he used to wear this ring whenever I would see him. And I would ask him, what do these, what do these initials spell? What is that? What, what is that? And he would say, boy, Tony, boy, I can't tell you that. If I tell you that, boy, huh? You just, you know... <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> you know, so just as a kind of a subtext to the poem, I mean, the poem does talk about that. Rings. I only have to look at my hands to see my father. The wide silver ring spans the proximal of my left hand's ring finger. I remember this, this ring as a child, asking my father what the raised letter spelt. But he laughed, and like everything else made of secrets, he would not tell. It was revealed after his funeral when we were at the house and the jewel bag get bring out from the bedroom for my brother and I to choose which as heirlooms. The bag held things which were either removed from my father's body as he lay dying or kept in a saucer beside his Bible. I chose the silver and soon deciphered that the raised letters were his initials, A. H.J. in Western typeface. The ring fit firm and right. My brother chose a chain. I want to I want to read a poem because a uh, poem here um, if I can find it because we're kind of in the vicinity of it. So just, just give me a sec. Yeah, please. Yeah. This is called um, Port of Spain General Hospital 1, POSGH 1. Having caught his first heart attack, the big man gives me hope to hold says he feels good enough to leave. He flirts with the nurses. He is in hospital on Charlotte Street, the, the hospital that always smells of burnt milk and disinfectant. That same hospital of first consciousness where I visited my grandfather after his blackout and sickness 
in 1977 after stopping with my grandmother on Gordon Street corner to buy the old bull peanut punch and mopsy biscuit. The hospital of windows from where I watched blue smoke rise from the morgue and turned away from my mother's bed to catch my evening flight. Two days later, she blinked hard into cancerous death. That same ex-colonial hospital in Memorial Park where my father once lifted me onto his shoulders so I could see the carnival pass. Uh, thank you. So I think I'm going to just read, yeah, just a couple more. I'm going to read um, the other poem that's in uh, Creole. Well, fully, I think fully Creole. I don't know if it is. It's hard to say anymore because I haven't lived there for so long, so my accent mightn't be as strong as it was when I was here. Um, but I had a, a bit of an argument, a bit of a back and forth with my editor at Bloomsbury, the editors at Bloomsbury, uh, concerning the use of the word quite in this poem. Because in Trinidad, of course, we use it for, to signify distance, but in England it means something quite different. So... <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't even intentional um, but yeah it means something different so there was a back and forth and I was like uh, you know they were saying oh pe people could mistake it for a typo and think that you meant quiet or something and I had to argue with them and say no they will get, the, they will, they will get it from the context so this is Tina Tina was my, was my sister who wasn't my father's child Tina Hear this one. The big man surveyed the house. He said, okay. All you will have to break down to build back that kitchen. While they're building, them pillars could support the bedroom. You and your daughter could stay in there. The living room need new flooring. Tiantech not connecting electric until you fix that roof. The wiring faulty. Fire. You're talking good money. Materials, cement, labor. But Tina... You can't live like this with termite in ruins. He had left quite Santa Cruz to go to Five Rivers to see what could be done for Tina and Trish. Tina, not Albert's daughter, but Baptist, no Baptist. And she have his last name. She dies two years after he does. Serpent didn't possess her womb, was stomach cancer. And two weeks after, the house she suffered to save fell down. Okay. So, yes. I'm going to uh, read a poem called Breakfast in D.C., which was, um, I was in Washington. I was at Howard University doing a conference many, many years ago. And after the conference, a group of us, a group of the, the panelists, um, went to the there was a british res house there was a british resident poet and writer in residence at that time at howard so we went to his apartment and we hung out and stuff like that and then we stayed up all night and the next morning we went out for pancakes in washington uh and it was the first time that i began to think about this was before my dad had died but it was be the time i started to think about the relationship between uh, having an absent father and my own work as a poet my own creativity and whether or not they'd inspired that experience of not having a father had inspired me in any way to become concerned with language. Breakfast in D.C. That night, after the conference in D.C., we broke free of post-colonial tautology to gather in the small room of the writer in residence. We were young scholars, poets, novelists, a journalist, we drank white wine warm and nodded to Neo Soul. I saw them recoil from the British resident when, in the marrow dark of 3 a.m., he rightly said that there was nothing like the sweet kick of crack cocaine. At dawn, we drove out in the doctoral candidate's car. We saw the Doric pillars of the Lincoln Memorial glowing in the unclear distance. Then the white gasp of the monument. We ordered pancakes with blueberries at Pete's on 2nd Street 
and shared our commonalities. And what we shared besides our blackness was that in our childhoods, our fathers had all been absent. Thanks. So I just want to have three questions to begin to wrap up today. And it's actually speaking directly to emerging writers in this space with us here. The first one, I actually want to follow up on your comment on the meaning of the Bocas Lit Fest. When you were delivering your comments around the award you received for your outstanding collection of poetry, Sonnets for Albert, you really spoke to the, you didn't have to apologize for your language, mm -hmm. the geography that you're coming with. Mm -hmm. And in a Caribbean audience, you could be fully Caribbean and speak to your own identity yeah. on your own terms. Yeah. But this is one of our first face-to-face -face activities that we have on this scale around Caribbean literature. And we still struggle to create space for the arts and literature. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to come home to one of the few countries throughout the region that still has this? You know, it's, it's still a fight. Everyone has to fight to keep up the literary arts wherever they are. Mm. What does it mean to come to a place in Trinidad and Tobago where you were born to see a very vibrant community still working to create space, battling for space for the arts, and knowing that you have a place here without apology, and other writers here are growing, thinking that there's a possibility there for them. Oh man, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful experience to be back. I mean, you know, it's very emotional because Trinidad is, is a really intense, emotionally draining space, and I mean, you know, it is, it is intense. It's a very advanced society. It's a very advanced society. It's post-postmodern society. It's really complex, really complex, dynamic interactions with people, language, language continually evolving, you know. Uh, but what is, what's interesting for me is that uh, I could drive around Port of Spain and I could pinpoint certain really important spots where things happened in my life. So in a way, it's, it's my life. I could see the map of, my, of my, the landscape of my mind and my thinking and my art in the landscape of the country. Um, because, you know, I'm a, Caribbean, I'm a Caribbean poet. I'm a Trinidadian poet. I see myself as a Trinidadian poet. And I draw on Trinidad and my experiences here. I left here when I was 22. So I had a kind of a full life here, part of a full life. So I know it. Um, coming back, you know, things have changed a lot. It's changed a lot. I mean, when I was here writing i was i started writing when i was about 11 and i wrote all through my teens and writing and writing and i never knew what a poet was i knew a poet was like ted hughes and seamus heaney and, and walcott and braidwit i knew these were poets but i had no understanding of what it meant to me it was like something i couldn't even think about i couldn't go to my grandmother and say i want to be a poet you know but i loved writing poetry so i was writing poetry and at some point in England, I decided I was a poet. And I think uh, people here have to make that same journey. I think that, you know, there's, there's being a liking to, loving to write poetry, but there's becoming a poet and claiming that space. That's one thing. But um, what gives me hope is that uh, the world kind of is flat now. Where everyone can see each other. We can all see each other. And because of technology and the internet, the, the, the literature in Trinidad has developed to a level because we're having dialogues with people, you know. I'm in London and I could have dialogues with people here, you know. I could speak to poets here directly. Whereas, you know, in the 80s or the 90s, early 90s, I wasn't able to do that. So there's a lot of cross dialogues happening between the US, the UK, you know, and Trinidad and the Caribbean which I think is developing the literature. I think we need that sort of uh, dialogue to happen for the literature to develop. We need to be in touch with each other. I think that's what's happening. Yeah, very much and connected to creating a space is about sustainability and how we finance our values, how we finance our institutions and finance our lives. You have lived as a creative writer and practitioner professionally for quite some time, but also as an academic. What advice would you give to emerging writers here who want to have a full-time life in the creative arts to really sustain themselves. There are some professional um, requirements and also contributions they have to make and to be a part of in order to sustain themselves and their families. I think it's really hard. You know, I think um, something was said to me many years ago, and I still remember it, and I can't remember who said it to me, but they said, if you're, gonna, if you're writing poetry to make money, do something else you know do something else 
because there are easier ways of making money than being a poet, definitely. I mean, it took me a long, long, long time to make any money from poetry, a long time. I mean, I didn't actually make any money from poetry to begin with. I made money from being an academic, from teaching, you know, or doing activities that are around poetry, like performance, you know, p performance poetry or making music, working with a band, working with music. Yeah, you make, you know, you can make an income from those things. Um, I still call it poetry. I still think that anything that you do that's connected to poetry is part of your poetic life. So, you know, I still consider myself a poet, even though I get up on a stage with a band and I make music. I'm still a poet doing that. I'm still a poet in the classroom teaching people how to write. Uh, so I think we need to, the way to make money from it is to diversify the idea of what a poet is. You know, is to think bigger than what, you know, a poet is not just someone who sits and writes verse. It's someone that goes out to activism, teaches you know, workshops, gathers people together, has reading groups, you know. You do a lot of stuff, you know. Apply for teaching jobs, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, we need to, to expand the meaning of the word in order to catch a lot of income streams that are available to various things that you could do as a poet, you know. Yeah, I think maybe when engineers start to bake cakes, <laughs> then I'll be a little bit more comfortable. But I understand exactly what you mean about the livelihoods and so on. That's a back analysis, eh? just, if you didn't know, now you know, right? But, uh, but this is my last question, and it seems a bit, the frame is a bit technical, but it's directly related to what is happening in terms of the trends in our education patterns. And I know you may have put some, like, parameters on what you think your contribution is around development, but I really want to close on this. Uh, we're looking at CSEC O-level participation. I want to look at the failure rates in the region. So for English A, that's what we write at around age 15 or 16, 26% of students throughout the Caribbean fail CXE English A. 33% of the male students fail English A. And that is a compulsory subject for your O-level certificate. Yeah. Let's bring it to English B, which is literature. It introduces young students to literature as in English, namely Caribbean literature. 16,910 students took the exam in 2021. 33% were male, yet 46% of the young men who took the exam failed, whereas 22% young women failed it. Now, I want to sound bad, English literature, I think it is get them who go and fail something, as well as schools that perform really well in it have it as a compulsory subject because it's part of the type of education that they would have had. So there's a kind of paradox where men win a lot of awards in poetry and creative writing at the prize level, but the feel overwhelmingly is by women right now in the Caribbean, it is a moment and a kind of enlightenment that we've been having since the 80s in particular. Mm -hmm. But at the level where education literacy is concerned, we see a low uptake by men, an underperformance by these young men, but also a real issue around young men and literacy. Yeah. So can you, do you want to weigh in on that at all? Ah, I, I don't know. I mean... Um what I wonder is what the syllabus looks like and what people are being made to study. I have no idea what people are being made to study. They'll study uh, you, you know. in about 10 years. Say it again? They'll study you in about 10 years. <laughs> it just takes some time for the curriculum yeah. to change. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how it's changed. I know when I was here, I, yeah, I mean, I could probably speak through my experience of it. When I was here, a lot of the stuff that we were learning was just, it wasn't relevant to us in any way. You know, a lot of the readings that we were doing just weren't relevant on a, on a cultural or spiritual level. So a lot of people became distracted, you know. I became distracted by it. You know, we were doing, a, we were doing Shakespeare and stuff like that, and I became distracted. I, you know, when we did Walcott, you would perk up a little bit because it was kind of relevant and you could, you could see it. But I don't know if that's still the case. I don't know if people are, are still, you know. I think a lot of times, I mean, me as an academic, I know that I have to keep abreast of, current trends in literature, what people are doing, what contemporary writers are doing, what contemporary poets are doing. So I have a module that I teach students, which is only contemporary poetry. We don't do any of the, the sort of, you know, the older poets. It's only contemporary poets alive now. So I w I'm wondering if that, if that is the case, people may become more engaged because they're engaging with language and looking at life and sort of reference points that they're familiar with. So it might be more engaging for people. So I don't know if, I don't, I have to see the syllabus, but you know. I understand. And I believe it has established a strong Caribbean canon in it. But perhaps in another forum, we could discuss that opportunity, what contemporary writers in the region are achieving 
and how they could weigh into what young people are doing here yeah. with literature and English, mm -hmm. but also the real issue of literacy, you know? Yeah. So I just want to open two questions to the floor. Um, it's only two, so we'll just go by the first two hands, and then we'll take them together. That's one, uno mas, por favor, two. Right, two men in a men's forum. What are we going to do? And then we will just take those two questions together. Anthony Joseph will respond to them. And then goodbye. Have no doubles after three. Yeah. Let's go. Thank you. Colleague thanks. will go first then, yeah. Someone's yes, you go first. go first. Yeah, Yeah. thanks for this. You talked about um, you were writing poetry, which you didn't feel like you were a poet. And then at some point, you were able to call yourself a poet. So if you could just share with us what happened there. Oh, absolutely. Anthony, could just take the second question one time? Because they they go run me. Nah. Okay, okay, okay. You go. We just take the second one, and then we. Only I'm sorry for being this. That is the socialist in me. It's how to keep a lot. Huh? Okay. Take away the democracy for a little bit, and then come back. So, so um, my question is that um, I knew your father. What? I I with Santa Cruz, <laughs> and um, he had a magical way about him. Wow. Um, he was exactly what you described. He used to paint my house every couple of years. Wow. And I used, to, I used to make sure I look out for him. And um, he was wayward, but he had this magnetism about him, yeah, which yeah. came true in your writing. Yeah. And, I, wow. and you did dwell on it. So the question is, I just wanted, you know, how you were able to marry the fascination with the man with the scamp of the man, mm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And still have because and everybody he met, he he magnetized you. Yes. Even though you knew that you know he had his flaws. So how were you able to marry both? It came out in your writing, but yeah. I don't know if it took a lot of experimentation to get that final blend. I think you. I think you actually. The question is. I mean, should I start? Yeah. I think the answer to your question is in is in the question. Is is he was magnetic? He was a, a really charismatic figure he was charismatic he was the life of the party and he was yeah so every encounter i had with him was was full of laughter and 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 joking and and old talk that's my experience of him i never had an experience of him where he was where it was a negative one so he was good at putting on a mask i think you know i think he had a lot of pain inside of him and a lot of turmoil that he never showed he never showed me or anybody he was he kept a lot of that hidden but um yeah, he was, that's why, that's how. And I think the answer is love. It's essentially, I loved him and I was able to <laughs> channel the love, you know? That's, that's it. The one more question, yeah? Uh, so, yeah. That, what happened to me was that uh, when I left Trinidad in 1989, one of the things that I took with me was a big a cardboard box of copy books that I'd kept since I was 11 years old writing poetry. And I kept that with me, and I was living in London in, I was in it was 19, what, 90, 91 or something? <laughs> I gotta take a breath. It was 91, I had an injury on my foot, I couldn't go out, and I had an old typewriter, and I pulled this box out and started typing out all of these old poems, and I realized, you're a poet. And that was it, it was a spiritual experience for me, yeah, because it's, you know. So let's give a round of applause to the award-winning writer and man of the hour, Anthony Joseph. Thank you. And thank you to NGC Bocas Litfest. And please follow the rest of the events of the program today. Take care.